People are, are licking these toads. And it's become such a scene that the U.S. Park Service is now warning people, you don't want to lick it because it's toxic. You don't want to eat it. You don't want to ingest it. Welcome once again to Free Associations from the Boston University School of Public Health, the Public Health and Medical Journal Club podcast for anyone as confused by the latest health study as I am by why I am doing the opening why? sitting here with Dr. Matt Fox. Why are you doing the opening? What's happened? What's happened to the world? Everything is getting a little topsy-turvy. But it brings up the question of we have a slightly new format for the next year of the podcast. Yeah. what? So you want to tell us about that? Sure. What we're going to do, we were so Matt and I were inspired by this past year when Chris was largely on sabbatical. We brought in all of these amazing faculty members, mostly new faculty members or new-ish faculty members from the School of Public Health. And what we're going to do for the next year is continue that, but a little bit more in depth and to pull on a few familiar voices and to add maybe one or two new voices to the mix and do a series of episodes with a handful of some of our amazing guests. Yeah. So unlike when we did this last time where we had different people coming in every month, this will vary from month to month, but we'll have a series of people who will come back for repeated episodes so our listeners can get to know some of our fantastic colleagues a little bit more in depth than when they do a one-off. So I'm looking forward to this. I'm looking forward to it, too. I think it's going to be a really exciting year. And so we have switched roles. So Matt and I have switched roles just for today. And so Matt is going to do the study description in a minute. And he was telling me this is actually the first time he has done it. And I'm really nervous. <laughs> nervous. I, I'm, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how this is going to go. <laughs> we, we So the history is Chris initially did them. And then, as we all know, Chris could sometimes go off on on tangents. So then Don started doing them, but then we would kind of go back and forth because then Chris really actually got quite good at it after after a bit. So then they switched off. But I was always in the host chair, so I have never been in the situation of having to do this. Well, this is interesting, and I have never been in this chair. And we're, I guess we're technically on the same, we're in the same chair. Yeah, we didn't, we, okay. didn't we didn't actually switch locations. Spots. But I, I, I have the timer, so that feels like the the power seat. You, you definitely have the power. <laughs> which is which is crazy. But I'm Jessica Liebler from the Department of Environmental Health at the Boston University School of Public Health. Here, as I said, with Dr. Matt Fox from the Departments of Epidemiology and Global Health from also the Boston University School of Public Health. Hi, Matt. Hello. As a reminder, head on over to the Population Health Exchange website, pophealthex.org, BU's hub for lifelong learning. And another reminder, give us a rating on iTunes or any of your major podcast sites to help others find us. Speaking of which, I always said, like, find us on iTunes or Stitcher. iTunes actually doesn't exist anymore. I don't know why I'm still <laughs> saying iTunes. And but see, now I don't even know that. It's so Apple Podcasts, right? Apple Podcasts it but is. But now Stitcher doesn't exist, right? Uh, I heard Stitcher collapsed and disappeared, at least based on an email I saw. Maybe I made that up. Nick's going to double check it to make sure I didn't just say something and that's going to cause the stock of Stitcher to plummet <laughs> when they actually exist. But assuming that I am correct, yeah, all these things that we're saying. So whatever the kids are using these days. We just date ourselves regularly, don't we? Matt and we I do. were recently on this little panel with college undergrads. And like I feel like every comment both out of our mouths just made us seem really old. So yeah, this yeah. kind of goes in that in that trajectory. And in my also. case, I actually am old, but you are not. <laughs> I'm, I'm well on my way, I have to say. I'm well on my way. Anyway, so now on to the show. Today in our first segment, our journal club segment, we're going to look at a study on the effectiveness of a new meningitis vaccine. And we can talk about the word effectiveness, which mm -hmm. is one of the key points of that article. In the second part of the podcast, our deep dive segment, we'll talk about school armed assailant drills, which is something of extreme relevance to parents around the country and to myself personally. And in our amazing and amusing segment, as always, we'll get into some lighter topics that have made us laugh out loud or things that we otherwise find unusual. So segment one, we are looking at an article 
that evaluated a new meningococcal vaccine trial in Africa. It was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, as was our second article. So we mm-hmm. have an, a New England Journal. Very NEJM heavy today. today, which is great. And the study was titled Meningococcal ACWYX, Conjugate Vaccines in 2 to 29-Year-Olds in Mali and Gambia by the first author, Fatima Haidara of the, and I don't have a very good French accent. Do you want to give it a whirl? Center pour le développement de, du vaccins du Mali Bamako. Oh, that is beautiful. That's beautiful. It's <laughs> terrible, actually, but uh, it was worth a try. Difference. Anyway, here are some headlines on this one. This one definitely made some some news. Pentavalent vaccine candidate for meningitis makes its case. That was in MedPage today. A quote-unquote game changer. New meningitis vaccine hailed as a major step in The Guardian. New vaccine trial shows promise in the fight against meningitis in Al Jazeera. And new vaccine boosts hopes of eliminating meningitis across Africa. That was in Eureka Alert. Matt. So let's start with you. Could you describe what the study was about and what their major findings were? Here we go. Okay, so meningitis is an infection that is inflammation of the fluid and membranes surrounding the brain and spinal cords, which are called the meninges. So that's where you get the name meningitis. And many of us will know that it's a really severe disease, right? Anytime you're going to have an infection around the brain, that's going to be cause for concern. In the United States, at least, it's it's often caused by a virus, but it can be caused by bacteria. It can be caused by lots of things, but the bacterial infection is the most severe. This would be more akin to something like pneumonia, where pneumonia is an infection of the lungs, and it can be caused by lots of different things, unlike something like, say, tuberculosis, which was always caused by the same pathogen. This is really an infection of a particular area, the area around the brain. As I said, really serious, but there is a vaccine available for meningitis. The problem is twofold. Number one, there are lots of different versions, different flavors of the meningitis pathogen. And so that's where you got that ACWYX. There are different strains named by letters. And so you need to cover the major strains, but also the the vaccines that exist are fairly expensive. And so there's this area of sub-Saharan Africa called the meningitis belt, which goes from Gambia and Senegal in the west to Ethiopia in the east. So traveling all along that sort of stretch of Africa where this infection is common, and it's caused primarily by six serogroups, A, B, C, W, X, and Y. And those are the ones that cause this invasive disease, typically anyway. Now, there was a vaccine developed called the Menafrovax, which was distributed and and highly implemented. And that has caused meningitis to largely disappear from the A strain, which was one of the most serious strains. But now what you end up with is a little bit of, of... sort of zero replacement. You get group C and X now causing the most disease. And again, a vaccine exists, but these are expensive. So the idea here was to build on the partnership, the same partnership that developed this previous Menafravac vaccine, which was a collaboration between the Serum Institute of India and PATH, to develop a new pentavalent vaccine, meaning five strains, that cover A, C, W, Y, and X, And in part, that's because they needed a new one because the strains have been changing. And now serogroup X has become an important strain and X was not covered in the previous vaccines. So what they did was they ran a safety and immunologic non-inferiority trial. Non-inferiority is slightly different from a lot of the trials that we normally talk about. In this case, there's no reason to think that the new vaccine would be better than the previous vaccine. All you want to do is show that it is no worse than, because if it's no worse than and it's cheaper, then we could deliver it to a lot more people. So you need slightly different statistical methods and you know a robust sample size to be able to effectively say that something is not inferior to something else. So they designed this study to be a randomized trial of 1,800, I want to say kids, but two to 29-year-olds, so not all of them, obviously kids, in Mali and Gambia between August 2019 and June of 2021. And they were randomized in age-stratified groups, so 600 per age group, two to 10 
11 to 17 and 18 to 29. And that was, of course, because the, the effect size may be different in different age groups. And they randomized them two to one. So twice as many people are going to get the new vaccine as the old vaccine. And so you either get the new vaccine or you get the old one. And they're going to compare them to see whether or not the new one is non-inferior in terms of these immunologic outcomes. In other words, are people developing an antibody response that would be consistent with the ability to mount an effective response against meningitis? So they look 28 days later, they you know, draw blood and look at the immune levels. That works well for the subtypes for which there is a comparison in the old vaccine, because then you could just compare them directly. For the X, there was no X in the previous vaccine. So for that one, rather than comparing them directly, what they did was they compared the new vaccine response to the X subtype to the to the lowest performing variant in the previous vaccine. So that would allow you to at least say it is at least better than what we saw previously in, in its lowest form. And, you know, that we assume is good enough because the previous vaccine was quite effective against these prior strains. So they do their randomized trial and what they found, and I, I won't give all the specific numbers because there's way too many of them, but just to say essentially this new vaccine for all the existing sero groups was just as good as the prior vaccine response. But in fact, in, in most cases, it was actually better. So you're actually seeing a better response. Now, you know, some of that could be statistical noise and it's, you know, maybe just equivalent, but in some cases it was substantially better. So zero group X, you were getting a 97% response rate, meaning 97% of people and zero group W also 98.5% of people in getting the new vaccine developed an immune response that you would believe would be sufficient to be able to mount a response and, and protect against these new strains. So overall, the new vaccine looks really good in terms of the prior strains. And then in terms of the X strain, which is the new one, it again met that standard for being better than the worst performing of the prior sera groups, suggesting that, you know, this, this, new vaccine should in fact protect people against the major strains plus this new one at potentially a substantially lower cost, meaning you could then deliver it to far more people. Also worth noting, there were no safety concerns evident. There were some, you know, some adverse events that you expect with any vaccine, particularly, you know, arm pain and, and, you know, swelling and things like that, but nothing really major occurred. So overall, really good news if you take these results at face value. Great. Thank you. I thought this was a really potentially high impact, obviously, a study looking at being fairly new to learning about the African meningitis belt, a fairly neglected component of the disease that they were looking to target this one sero group that had largely been unaffected by prior vaccines. Mm -hmm. And so it seems high impact in that regard. Can I ask you a technical question that I did not understand in reading this? I didn't say I didn't understand it, but that it was different. They were using 96% confidence intervals and p-values, one-sided p-value to look for the kind of differences in the titers as they were comparing them by the sera groups and significance levels of 0.02 and 0.0051. And I was interested in your take on why deviate from the standard 95% confidence interval and the 0.05 p-value. I wondered this myself. So I don't know the answer on the 96% the confidence interval. I mean, we know that 95% is an arbitrary number. Right. So to go to 96% is perfectly fine. Now, 96% is actually going to be more stringent than 95. So in some sense, you know, it's certainly not an issue. It it could have to do with some of the ways that which you deal with interim looks at the data. They, they sort of have these approaches called like alpha spending approaches where you, you have to go a little bit higher than what you normally would because you're going to peak at the data early. But I don't, I don't actually remember seeing that in there, although that could have been part of the plan. The one-sided p-value, though, that does have a, an explanation that's pretty straightforward. Back when I first started at 
the Department of Global Health many years ago, we did a series of, and we we talked about one of them, go back to one of the earliest episodes of the program, we talked about one of them because we wanted to critique one of our own studies, a series of pneumonia trials. And these were done as equivalency trials. So the idea was to treat kids with oral antibiotics versus injectable antibiotics. The idea being that for pneumonia, the idea being that if you can show that treating kids with oral medication is just as good as treating them with the equivalent as an injectable, then you don't have to hospitalize those kids. You don't risk the infections that you might get in the hospital. It's going to be lower cost for everybody. So it's a better approach. So equivalency trials are designed based on the idea that you want to show this is no better and also no worse, right? It's sort of roughly almost the same. And we were, we have been asked year after year, why did we do an equivalency trial instead of a non-inferiority trial? Non-inferiority trial simply says, all we want to do is show it's no worse. And the idea there is if you're going to show it's no worse, you only are worried about one side of the distribution rather than both sides. And so that's where you get to the, you can get to the the 2.5%. Although Typically, the alpha is divided a, a little bit differently, but that's the the general idea. And the answer to the question has always been, why did we do an equivalency trial instead of a non-inferiority? It was because we didn't know any better at the time. <laughs> Had we learned our lesson, we would have, because a, you could typically have a smaller sample size in a non-inferiority trial than an equivalency trial. Right. That's very interesting. So it relates to kind of the ultimate hypothesis and the goal of the non-inferiority trial as a specific endpoint and maybe the... The 96% confidence interval is more arbitrary. Yeah, than thinking I, about I mean, that. Yeah. It, again, it may have a reason, but I don't, mm. it, it didn't jump out to me what it was. Thanks. Very interesting. I feel like in reading these vaccine trial studies now, I look at them with different eyes after COVID. Mm-hmm. And I was wondering if you do as well. I feel like in Looking at these studies now, the sort of things that jump out at me are probably not the things that would have jumped out at me in reading this study, you know, in 2018, so for, for example, example 2019. What, what, what are the kinds sample of things that jump size, out? Sample size. Okay. Right. So sample size jumps out specifically as it relates to their adverse effect reporting. Mm-hmm. And as I've mentioned before on this podcast, I think in this direction, in part because I have a whole wing of my family that's vehemently anti-vax, mm-hmm. which has pushed up against my own thinking and my own kind of professional inclinations. But one of, and so I'm fairly deeply familiar with some of the themes of that movement because of this. And one of the one of the core themes has to do with sample size for vaccine trials and are the sample sizes large enough to identify adverse effects? And then how do you evaluate those adverse effects against the benefits of the vaccine? And this is obviously like a huge issue in all the vaccine literature, kind of how do you project the benefits of the vaccine and kind of compare that to the adverse effects? And what are the adverse effects that would only be evident if you had super large or impractically large studies. And one of the things that I felt like this study, I thought this was a great study Mm -hmm. in so many ways. This was really, really, really well done and addressed a really important issue. One of the things in the era of COVID that I would have done is I would have elevated their power calculation. They kind of buried it in one of the supplements and they said, this is how we derived the numbers of participants in the groups and we're putting it into like supplement 15. And I would have elevated that more. Into, and talked that through a little bit and acknowledged that in a sample size of 1,800, if they have really rare but terribly severe side effects, maybe they wouldn't pick it up, and that's a limitation of the design. And so I was thinking that that was, that was a thought that I had now that I would not have had prior to the pandemic in reading a vaccine trial study, especially one that's involving young kids um, who obviously are a population that's you know, uniquely burdened by this disease. Yeah, it's it's really interesting to me, and this is just total coincidence, that the first study that we picked post-Chris mm-hmm. is a vaccine right. study, yeah. when, of course, Chris studied <laughs> vaccines, worked on vaccines at, for a while, and is going on to work on vaccines again. So interesting that we we chose to do this without Chris, who could, who could speak to some of these things. Right. But one of the things that what your comment highlights to me is the challenges of dealing with and and obviously this is not where I thought we were going to go with this, but dealing with the the anti-vax community, because like the reality is 
those sorts of, of concerns that you raised are things that people think deeply about and 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 obviously you care a lot about, but it's the kind of thing where it, it can look like there was, you know, nobody cared about that. And then you can say, oh, not only did they not care about it, they knew that this was going to cause serious adverse events. Let me be clear. That is not what happened. I'm That's just saying this is what this, this is sort of trial, the right, way you can all. twist this yeah. is to say, oh, they knew there were going to be adverse mm-hmm. events. So they intentionally had mm-hmm. a small sample size so they wouldn't pick it up. Right. Mm-hmm. That's, of course, not how this works. But it's it's so easy to twist it if you're not part of of this community that does these trials. The reality is you are correct. I mean, there's there's no way that you will ever in a, a vaccine trial pick up with enough power to actually say anything rare, very rare, but serious events, right? So we're talking about things like Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is a a really severe complication that does occur with some vaccines, not all, but it it has been related to some vaccines. But these it's incredibly rare, like one in a hundred thousand, one in a million type outcomes. You will never pick that up with your typical trial. But in this case, to me, this is this is one of those ones where I feel like the the argument doesn't quite hold because, you know, with COVID, you could say if we're vaccinating, you know, if we're doing trials in in for COVID vaccine in kids, the chances that a kid is going to have a severe outcome is uh, from COVID is going to be really low, not zero. And of course, the that does that ignores long COVID, but but let's just say the the sort of primary severe illness is is rare. And so if there are rare complications, we would have to really weigh those. It's the benefit outweighing the harm. But in this case, this is an illness that is so severe and is going to be more common than those very rare illnesses. The the benefit there is obviously going to outweigh the potential risks assuming that we can demonstrate that you know any complications are rare and while we don't know what the rate of of any adverse event might be from a vaccine after we do the trial if they don't appear in the trial the sample size is large enough to be able to say it's it's got to be at least x because we didn't pick it up we didn't pick up anything in this trial of 1800 people so it doesn't fully solve the problem, but I, I can I can see why you would be looking at different things now than you were before. It's really interesting, and it has led me to wonder if you know if authors who are reporting on these sort of studies, if there is some sort of new small obligation to comment on that, to comment on, like you're saying, you know, the rate of the adverse effect that would not be picked up in the context of this study, the implications of the severity of disease. That even if there were adverse effects, the disease is so severe in the populations that would be affected that the benefit is clear in line of even, you know, of this rare event. I don't know. I was I was interested, like if there's a, you know, if the communication piece differs now, given all the pressure and the hullabaloo about covid vaccines. It's it's a really interesting question. I don't know. I mean, I'm not convinced there's anything you could say that would that assuage those anxieties. That is going to assuage right? somebody who I think you're right. who is looking to tell cuz I mean, I just having read so much of the the anti-vax liter, you know, a literature is probably the wrong word for it, but the arguments that are made they will they will pick up on absolutely anything that could look like an any kind of an anomaly in any way which of course small deviations happen all the time in studies right we don't live in a world where we're, we're not experimenting on petri dishes right we are we are doing actual experience on humans who have free will make their own decisions and we support them in doing that right nothing is ever going to go 100% perfect to plan you can find that and read in nefarious reasons for that and so i just feel like you you we cannot pre pre but all yeah, of the arguments really because great. they will just find new arguments. I don't know what the answer is, though. I agree with you on that. I agree with you on that. I think one of the interesting things, too, about this study is I looked in seeing the title. I looked to see which company sponsored it. 
And it doesn't seem to have been sponsored by one of the vaccine companies, right? It was like Bill and Melinda Gates and Wellcome Trust and Commonwealth. Like it was it was a bunch of non-industrial funders. H- hence the reason why this could be a cheaper vaccine, right? right? I mean, we already have vaccines for meningitis that are expensive. So therefore, the ability to get them where, the, you know, to the number of people that you need is is hard. We could make those vaccines cheaper, I am sure, but then there's no there's less profit to be made or any profit to be made. I, I don't I, I shouldn't say too much there because I don't know the specifics of the of the market for this particular vaccine. But I do know that the reason this trial was done was because there wasn't a vaccine that was cheap enough that was covering the relevant serotypes. Can I ask you a different question? This is pivoting to a different topic. One of the limitations that I th- think is important and good to discuss on this paper, and the authors mention it, is that their their endpoint is is kind of immunological response at 28 days after the vaccine. And they talk a little bit about how there have been other vaccines that were licensed on the basis of short-term immunological response. And so they make a, f- a forceful argument in a way that is you know, not, not unique to scientific writing, but they, they definitely are forceful in their writing in the context of a scientific paper to say that this vaccine should be moving towards licensure because of the clear effect. But the effect they observe is, is, is at a month after the vaccine. And so the question is, what if it's, what if the immunological response wanes a few months after, or how do they know that there is long-term effectiveness in terms of thinking about that non-inferiority? We obviously see the benefit of the existing vaccine because incidence of the disease went way down within like four to six months after the, they were talking about the background. After the initial rollout of the earlier vaccine, incidence of meningitis went way down. And then there was this emergence of this subgroup X that was kind of filling in in this in you know endemic space. And so that was something I was interested to get your take on. Like, should, you know, should we wait for a longer time period to see what the effect is or is 28 days enough to say, let's move it towards licensure? Again, this would be a case where having Chris here would be so great because he could speak to a lot of these things. This is a, a bigger issue, I think, than just this this study or even vaccine studies in general. It's this idea of surrogate outcomes, right? We, The thing we really want to know is, does this protect kids from getting meningitis? And then ultimately, does it protect kids from either experiencing very severe complications from meningitis or, or death? And that is not the outcome here, because if you wanted to do that study, that would be a much longer, much more expensive and time-intensive study. And you potentially run the risk that in the meantime, a lot of kids will get type X or or something similar and experience severe complications. So we understand the biology, the, the immunology well enough to know that an immune response at 28 days is a pretty good predictor of your ability to, to fight this particular pathogen. But it is not foolproof. And, and I, I would absolutely agree with you. We don't know for sure exactly what the long-term benefit is. Now that said, in this case, I mean, we're dealing with the group that created a previous vaccine is creating this one. It's, it's effectively now just developing a new, adding in this new strain. I don't know what other changes would have been made in the strains that were in the previous version. So I suspect in this case, it's a, it's a, it's easier to make the leap than it might be in other studies. But even in those other studies where you don't have that, I, I think, you know, immunology is one of those fields where we understand it well enough that we can we can say there's a pretty good chance that this is going to correlate with immunity and protection from meningitis. But but I would agree that we don't know for sure. And, you know, there are other fields where we use surrogate markers that are are less clear that they actually correlate with what we what we really want in terms of survival and from treatments that can potentially be, you know, life saving and potentially be not. And we really do want to know what's the benefit. The other thing that I want to say, and I realize I should have said this when we were talking earlier about the adverse events and conspiracy theories or, or anti-vax. Research on these treatments, in this case, preventive measures, vaccines, does not stop with licensure. So even if these this vaccine is licensed, we don't then stop and just say, okay, well, you know, we're we're good, we we've got it licensed, we're done. 
if you think about vaccines in the United States, the, the FDA typically requires that you do phase, so these would be phase three trials, they would then require phase four studies, which phase four studies are studies where you're now going to do the large scale surveillance on the population to look for those adverse events. So we don't we don't just simply, you know, say, OK, you know, we've we've got it. We're done. And I think that's the impression that people had with covid, which is that we just you know, we, we approve these vaccines and then we just, you know, put them out into the public and nobody you know, paid any attention to whether or not they were actually right. A, working and B, were associated with adverse events. There was a ton of research that was being done, particularly on the adverse events of concerns with COVID vaccine, like the pericarditis and myocarditis. There was a ton of research on that. And we would be making a strategic decision in this case that we have good evidence to suggest this is, this is going to work, but we would continue to monitor it and follow it up and find out. Right. I think that's a strong response. I think there is this thread right now. And, you know, one of our political actors in the U.S. brings it up all the time, Robert Kennedy Jr. He, you know, I've heard him on TV saying to. that there's right, that there's that there's no human trials of vaccines, that vaccines are not, you know, are not that, that, that there's no studies like this. And so for any of you who have people in your circles, I mean, this is this is this would be a powerful article to share kind of even it's, you know, even in these kind of I think the limitations are kind of mild on this one. This is a very strong study demonstrating effectiveness of a vaccine compared to another vaccine that also was effective. And so looking at kind of the marginal benefit of adding a, a, you know, a small component. But yeah, the vaccine world now is, is crazy. And it does put a slightly different onus on how these studies are communicated and talked about. And so I would yeah. absolutely agree. The world has definitely the world has definitely changed. There was an anti-vaccine sub set of the population prior to COVID, but I think that has gotten larger. I mean, I think we have good evidence that that has gotten larger through COVID. And it's a shame because vaccines are one of the most effective public health interventions we've ever had, but really effective public health interventions that some people are deciding are bad for reasons that are really unfounded. Right, right. I agree with you. This is a really powerful study and can speak to that in some way. So, okay. So, We'll pivot to something extremely different. Extremely Ext- different. Extremely different yep. for our but segment really, two. I gotta say, really upsetting. Okay, so so let me premise this, and yep. then I want to ask about the upsetting factor. So, in our second segment, this is a short perspective piece, again from the New England Journal, written by Mary Beth Miotto and Robin Kogan, called "Empowered or Traumatized: A Call for Evidence Informed Armed Assailant Drills in U.S. Schools." This was a piece that was written largely focusing on the lack of evidence that these drills are effective. And what do we make of that as people in public health, in medicine, in pediatrics, and parents? And so I I, I have my own thoughts on this, and I'm interested to hear, did, did your kids go through these drills? Your kids, I think, are a little bit older than mine. And I think there are real differences even on the basis of five or 10 years in terms of what kids have experienced through the school system, given these active shooter drills. What was your take on this one? Yeah. So to answer your question, my kids did, did go through these drills. I I would say they went through the kind of milder forms of these. So they were, I would say they were more in the area of general preparedness. Some of the things that are described in this paper sound like there are some places which take this to the absolute extreme of actually simulating, like just pretending or not pretending, but but simulating as if they were an actual active shooter and people then just react. And my my reaction to this is to just start off with how incredibly sad that we are even in the position of having to discuss this and debate this and and think about what is the best way to be prepared. I mean, it's a huge indictment on our society, our country, our culture, all of those things. And so I, I just, to me, that is the the most important thing that I came away with. It seems to me that being prepared for catastrophic traumatic events is a good thing if and only if, one, you can actually do something about it. Two, the likelihood of such an event is enough that it outweighs the 
traumatization that comes along with just preparing for these. And number three, that, you know, that, that there's something you can do, something that you could do that is actually effective. And this article makes it clear. And I, I think it just confirms what I probably already thought, which is we don't have any evidence and nor could you have any evidence because thankfully as horrible as these things are, in the scale of the number of, of schools that we have in the United States, they are still rare events, right? They're, they're way more common than they should be, but they're still rare events. And given that there is no single standardized approach that we take, you could almost never evaluate whether or not any of these things have been effective, in addition to which, even if there were a standardized approach, the scenarios that people are encountering differ in each case. So being able to evaluate them is impossible. That said, if we have no evidence that these are effective, we are in a real bind because we are also in a situation where levels of anxiety and depression amongst school-age kids is at an all-time high and has serious consequences. And while I'm not in any way suggesting that the only reason for that is anxiety over school shootings, it is a piece of them. And when you do these drills, you inevitably ratchet up the stress and anxiety and and trauma for these kids. And so that's a real serious thing to be doing if we have no evidence that it works. Right. I mean, I, I agree with you. And I, until reading this piece, I didn't realize that there was basically a total lack of an evaluative component of many of these drills. I mean, my my kids have done them in different ways at different ages. I know one of my daughters, when she was very young at her school, they did a drill where she was in kindergarten, and I remember it, where the teacher told them, this is what we're going to do if a bear gets into the classroom. And maybe that's not as scary as an armed gunman. Still pretty scary. But that's scary. still pretty scary if you're five years old. And she came home and she was like, you know, if there's a bear that comes into the room, we're supposed to go under our desks and we're supposed to like, you know, or or cuddle in the closet and stay silent. And that and she and she talks about it now. She's 13. I mean, she still remembers that episode. And then as she got older, I was like, well, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't really a bear that they were concerned about. And she sees the news and as she's gotten older. There's more context to it in terms of what they were doing, but in the lack of any evaluative piece, the you know the impact, the traumatic impact of these exercises seems really huge, and perhaps even more so than the sort of drills that my parents talk about, where they used to do the kind of atomic bomb prep in their school where they would go under, you know, in, in terms of like being a very, very, very low risk, but obviously highly catastrophic potential event. The school shootings, I think to kids now, as much as they are low risk, they still seem kind of real. And the oh, anxiety oh, seems, seems very real, especially as they get older towards middle school and high school. And yeah, just yeah. to clarify, when I say low risk, no, I just no, mean I in sort of in, in in Statistically, terms, they, right, and the authors is, make the same point. Statistically, it, a low risk. Yeah, right? but it is still a, right. a risk, and we take mm. precautions. Again, you know, again, we were talking about vaccines, right? right. We take precautions against one in a million right. risks, right? So right. that's understandable when it's catastrophic, and we're talking about you know higher than that maybe. But as you say, I mean, it's still the 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 way that it feels to kids in these situations is very real. Right. And I was in reading this, I was, you know, part of my training was in occupational health and in occupational health, there's this framework called the hierarchy of controls in terms from like an industrial hygiene point of view. If you're going to intervene in a workplace to protect the worker, how do you prioritize the different sorts of things you can do? And at the top are the best you know, at the top of the pyramid, kind of the best sort of controls are those that address the systematic issues that lead to the risk to the worker, him or herself. So the idea, if there's a toxic exposure in the workplace, can you eliminate the toxic, you know, can you eliminate the toxic chemical from the workplace as a preferred approach rather than having the worker wear a mask? And these sort of drills to me reflect the absolute failure of any level of the hierarchy controls over having young children hide 
which seems to be the very last ditch effort. And it just, to me, was so sad that it was reflecting. That's the best we think we can do right now is to is to have five and six year olds, you know, cower in a closet because every level above that, every systematic level that involves adults can't be addressed to reduce this risk for whatever reason. So I don't know. I have felt in seeing the impact just on my own kids personally and also reading this article, I have felt that these these drills should just not involve the kids. These drills could involve adults. I think teachers should know what to do. And I think they can be talked about in generic terms with kids developmentally appropriately at different ages. But I think actively engaging the kids in practice, especially when they're little, just stokes anxiety and and doesn't really seem to prevent very much. Yeah. So you mentioned the Cold War drills right. where where our parents' generations would hide, you know, they would do these practice drills where they would hide under their desk. I mean, that's, it seems to me that's a potentially apt analogy here in the sense of those were completely useless, right? If, right. if, if a bomb, <laughs> know, atomic yeah. bomb drops, hiding under your desk isn't going to do anything for you really. So what does that do? All it does is it ramps up the anxiety and you worry about, you know, uh, an atomic bomb. Here, it isn't clear exactly how far we are from, you know, because, you know, again, I don't, I don't, I don't know that anybody can really accurately assess the risk, but if we have no evidence that these are effective, and I should clarify by effective, I mean, obviously the, the ultimate goal would be that these would save lives, but we don't even know that they're effective in the sense of do after these trainings, do do kids actually, can they, can they actually demonstrate mm-hmm. to you they know what they, in theory, the adults want them to be doing? We don't even have that level of information. Right. Without that, it seems to me, we, we, we have no idea if we are in that same situation of we are doing something that is is of no potential, be- you know, maybe of no benefit, but just creates harm for kids. I'm not saying they're of no benefit. I, I'm saying we don't know. And until we know, we do know that they, they cause anxiety. Right, right. No, I, 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 I hope that this piece ends up kind of shifting things a little bit. It's very prominently located in the New England Journal. And I'm, I'm hopeful that, you know, kind of either bringing more evidence to bear on the basis of these trainings or limiting them in their scope, focusing on training the teachers and the administrators on what they would do and kind of leaving largely leaving the kids out of it. I, I, I hope I can hope that that is the benefit of of this piece, which I think was really well done. And they do they yeah. do kind of end with that, right? I mean, they're talking about standardized response protocols are needed to prepare communities for rare but sometimes fatal scenarios, but live action, hyper-realistic drills unsupported by research have no place in a student-centered, trauma-responsive learning environment. We must insist on a standardized public health approach to drills that now define our children's school experiences. This commitment must include a national research agenda to evaluate outcomes. It's time to reject school crisis simulations that rely on survival reactions in students and educators and which have not been rigorously studied. I, I, I could not... I could not agree more. And there's also been an industry that's emerged to develop and support these sort of trainings. And so like everything else, there's, you know, there's there's corporations that benefit from having these, you know, these events in the classroom. Yep. Anyway, on to something a little bit lighter. Segment three, amazing and amusing. Matt, what do you have? Okay, I've got a short one. I, I heard about this on NPR and it just sort of intrigued me. This was a piece from the journal Physics of Fluids. The author It's my favorite journal. Yeah, How and you, you <laughs> would go and read that on the BJ. <laughs> right, right, of course. The authors Tereki Sumnu and Sehin from Osegan University and Middle East Technical University published this study in which they tried to understand what it is and what are the right components that go into making gummy candy Mm. taste good or or be pleasing, (laughs) recognizing that obviously taste matters, but it may be that texture matters more than taste, right? There's nothing worse than, you know, finding some gummy bears in your, your cupboard after, you know, they've been sitting there for like several weeks and they're completely dried out and hard. And you look at them and they look good and then you put them in your mouth and you bite teeth. down. <laughs> and it's, it's just really unpleasant. And so they looked at all of these different factors that would go into the potential ways in which candy, gummy candy in particular, might be made to taste good. 
So they changed a number of, of variables, things like the glucose syrup to sucrose ratio to starch and gelatin concentrations. They wanted to see how moisture content and pH change things and how the general texture change things. And they looked at this both before and after storing them for periods of time in different environments, so different temperatures for a matter of weeks up to a period of a year. And they found that texture actually probably matters a lot, that particularly hardness is something that people really dislike. Moisture content and pH were heavily dependent on the glucose syrup to starch ratio, whereas gelatin didn't appear to affect things much at all. But they said the most striking finding was that hardness and average cross-link distance, which is sort of a a measure of the the texture there, was not affected by the amount of starch. And so you could probably not have to worry about these too much. But the overall take-home message is that texture actually really matters for, Mm. for gummy candies. And it may, in fact, matter more than flavor. Wow, isn't that interesting? You know, gummy gummy science. This is a new a new discipline emerging in the science of gummy bears. I think it's particularly important, you know, you got it for for candy, but then of course mm. there's this whole gummy vitamin uh, movement. Gummy that vitamin right, movement right, and for then sure. there's the the gummy yeah. marijuana industry. So, you know, you've got you've got all these kinds of areas where you're going to need better understanding better gummies. of the fluid right. dynamics of Gummy candy. That's fascinating. You know, I admittedly really like gummy candies and, and, and gummy vitamins, but that when they're too hard, they're really bad. Or when they're like so sticky that they're like really stuck in your teeth. So you're right. There does have to be this sweet spot of like soft, but not too sticky. Absolutely right. right. Where do you fall on the, the Sour Patch Kids? I, I like think them. The sour, I, it's like a gummy I, candy yeah. coated in the, what's the... Malic oh, acid. Thanks, Nick, for malic the rescue. Acid. Right. That, that makes them taste sour. What, what, how do you feel about those? I like. I like them. I you know. I like. I do like sour candies. I, I wouldn't say I like like hot sauces. I'm not. I'm a not a fond of sauces. all all kind of spicy or sour foods, but I definitely like like um, kind of the Sour Patch Kids. And I think it's because I, like when I was a kid, they were super popular when yeah. we go to the movies. And yeah. that, and so they were like, there was like social and everyone's eating them. And how many could you eat? And could you eat the really, really spicy, the rocket ones or what, you know? So the, I have these fun memories of those sour I, candies. Um, I love them, but I can eat like four mm-hmm. before it starts to like, burn the right. the skin on my tongue and the roof of my mouth so i have to like really take it slow so you mentioned movie candy what is your what is your go to movie snack slash candy my go to movie would probably you know i haven't been to the movies like in a, like actually a movie theater oh, in 100 okay. years right. so this would be going back quite a ways but the one i used to love was non pareils like the chocolate with the i don't even know what those uh, are what they're are they? like little chocolate circles and then they have little white like like hard sprinkled. Oh, like, like snow cones or what are they? Snow, caps. Snow, caps. snow caps. Snow caps. Yeah. Snow caps. yeah Those yeah, yeah, are yeah, my yeah. favorite. Those are my favorite. What, I, I they're don't like even... chocolate chips with like, but they're bigger. Like, yeah. Yeah. I don't know that I've ever had them. What are the white <laughs> dots we're made of? Sugar. Just like sugar I have no candy idea. Coating? Something. I don't even think it had, it was just crunchy. It was kind of like added a little bit of crunchiness. Yeah. What about you? What was your Tw- favorite? Twizzlers. Oh. Without question. And, and when I was a kid, it was like to use the Twizzlers as a straw. Oh, wow. To drink some sort of sugared beverage, like but so, I wouldn't yeah. do that anymore. It's actually, it is actually, it was never very good. It was just more fun to do. Uh, good. Oh, cool. You know, I always have to keep, you know, just in, in talking about the gummies, my three-year-old loves the gummy vitamins. Oh, and we'd, oh, we'd I, eat just like a, a jar of them in one sitting. So would I. Yeah. And do you ever worry about, like, I, I sometimes let him have more than the allotted number. And I, I sometimes like, have more than the allotted OD? number myself. <laughs> I worry. Like if he's going to OD on like the, the vitamins. I think there are there are certain vitamins that if you get too many of, mm-hmm. it's a problem. I think in general, it's, I, I could be wrong, but I think in general, it's, it's probably not. But could, I, I yeah. can't imagine double the dose is really going to be. Because it's definitely a risk with those candies. If they taste sure. really good, someone's just going to eat and eat them. I right? feel like yeah. we would have heard about it if, if mm. that was happening. 
Stay tuned for next yeah, episode. Yeah, really, <laughs> right, really. Right, right. I have something kind of goofy and short. Again, something different. This was something that I saw recently on the Facebook page, which again marks me as a middle-aged, if not elderly person. For sure. <laughs> of the U.S. National Park Service. And I guess following that also marks me as an even older person. Uh-huh, um, it does. But they, they put out a note that asked visitors to refrain from licking the Sonoran Desert Toad. <laughs> I mean... Please hold back, right? Because like that's an obvious thing you might want to do. When you see it, what do you want to do? You right. want to lick it, right? And they actually have a really funny, a, a really funny <laughs> page and just communications. It's very tongue in cheek. But apparently, the Sonoran Desert Toad. Maybe six months ago, there was a write up in the New York Times about this venom that this toad elicits when it is threatened by predators that if you smoke it can give you a very short high. And so since we were a few episodes ago talking about psychedelics, mm -hmm. now this is something it's within our wheelhouse. And so this is, it's called, it's called Bufo. <laughs> Bufo. Bufo. And so, and so there is an industry now where People will take this Sonoran desert frog, which is actually, and it's not endangered, but it's considered a threatened species in the southwest of the U.S. and in the northern parts of Mexico. And they kind of like stroke it in a way that causes it to eject this venom. They harvest is the, the venom. Is the venom poisonous to humans? It's poisonous if you eat it. So if you were to to eat it, it's toxic. I don't know if you would die of it, but it's 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 toxic. But if you smoke it, which some of these people do, it can elicit a short high of like 15 to 30 minutes that people who engage in this behavior say is kind of like a pleasurable near-death experience involving uh, hallucinations. And so there are these groups that where people can pay for this experience. What? Where they are given a, a, a joint of this Sonoran toad serum to smoke. And then they have, you know, kind of as a group, they engage in this 15 to 30 minute experience. And it's become such a scene that the U.S. Park Service is now warning people not to, because people are, are licking these toads thinking that there is something, you know. And but then would, <laughs> licking cause the, I mean, then you're ingesting. Yes. And so that's where, you know, they profile in this piece that I was reading recently in Science News, they profile like the local leader of the Herpetology Society who's saying, you don't want to lick it because it's toxic. You don't want to eat it. You don't want to ingest it because that's what the toad Maybe is doing the for the toads alone. And so that's, that was the, the, the park service, you know, please step back from the toad, leave it alone, and please just stand a step away from well, the toads. That is wild. Nick, Nick, you've tried it. Is it <laughs> is it exactly like they that's been described? No, Nick has never tried it. <laughs> so, okay, so this is just reminds me. So to all our Australian listeners, when I was in college, there was this documentary that I remember watching. About the cane toads in mm. Australia. Do you know the story of the no, cane toads? No, I don't. My, my understood. Do you know that? Do you know this? The cane toads were were brought in to eat the what was like the cane beetle. Like these, you know, they brought them in, and this was going to you know solve the problem of these beetles that were eating. I I, I may have the story wrong, but that, that were destroying the the sugar cane crops or whatever it was, and it turns out the toads didn't really have much interest in eating the beetles, but they they did take over and became an invasive species such that like now they are everywhere and like a, a huge nuisance and they kill, you know, native animals and things like that. But in this documentary, there was also somebody that they interviewed who does exactly that, extracts the venom from the cane. To oh, sorry. And the poisonous, they have the, a poison mechanism. So they like... Cats will, you know, get at them and then they'll kill the cat mm. um, through this. But people also smoke the venom from the cane toad. And so they interviewed wow. people who were big enthusiasts of that. <laughs> I, I, there's not something that I would have thought was something you had to tell people not to do. I generally don't lick animals. Right. Pretty much at all. No, I, I feel would, like that's I a would no -no. say exclusively Self -preservation no. Self-preservation right, says right, right. don't do that. But there is a whole, I mean, for people who are into this, there is kind of a whole movement. And there's this, you know, the, these toads are, and the, you know, there is quite a number of animals actually that if you were to extract and then smoke some of their secretions, you could get some sort of high. Some of them are profiled in some of this, you know, there's like certain types of fish. And, um, and you know, many of them are, are kind of frogs and toads, I think, because maybe they're 
more likely to have these venoms as a defensive mechanism. I don't know the things we don't know. Okay, right? so don't the the take home message is don't lick toads. Don't lick toads. Don't don't eat beetles. Right? Don't, yeah. yeah. Don't, just, just stay, stay away, away from just the wild flesh. <laughs> just stay don't away. Put, don't from put don't the put them in your mouth. <laughs> Except for the gummy bears. Yeah, obviously. Right. Right. Well, that is the end of our program. If you have any feedback on this or any other episode, or you want to suggest a study or topic for us to take on, you can find us on the Population Health Exchange website at pophealthex.org. We want to thank Nick Guler for sound and editing and Mark Takakchi for editing. Thanks for joining us. We hope you enjoyed it, and we hope you download our next episode. 